And was the difference between being able to stay, keep the doors open, or, uh, you know, possibly, you know, closing. And now more small business owners like her will get the help they need to stay open. Millions of dollars approved locally today will help small businesses in Marion County rebound from this pandemic. Helping small businesses make it through the pandemic. I'm Nicole Griffin tonight in Noblesville, following back up with a small business owner after he received grant money from the city. Hospitalizations are flattening throughout the state. I'm Kara Kenny. We talk with an expert who says we may have already peaked. This is RTV6 News at 5, working for you. Thank you for joining us here at 5. I'm Amanda Starantino in the RTV6 studio. And I'm Mark Mullins, continuing to practice social distancing from my home. And we begin tonight with money approved locally and nationally to help small businesses rebound from this medical crisis that's become an economic crisis. Let's start locally here. Today, the Indianapolis City County Council approved a $25 million funding boost to the Indy Chamber's Rapid Response Local Fund for Small Businesses. RTV6's Megan Sanctorum spoke with one local business and found out why this this program is so important and how you can apply. This is typically the busiest time of year for Hinchman Racing Uniforms. Located on Gasoline Alley, they make custom race suits for drivers all across the country. But the pandemic is hitting their business hard. It's uh, had a huge effect on our business. When they closed racing down, virtually the phones quit ringing. The company employs fewer than 10 people, and it's been around for decades. They've weathered storms before, but never anything like this. The owner tells us she thinks they'll be able to pull through thanks to the Indy Chamber's Rapid Response Loan Fund. So far, the Chamber has administered more than 100 loans, and thanks to a vote from council this morning, they'll have an additional $25 million to help even more small businesses. That money will be back by the federal stimulus bill. We're over a thousand inquiries already. Um, and what we're hearing from businesses is that they want to keep their employees, they want to keep their customers, they want to pay their suppliers, um, but that they need access to capital to do it. And that's why a program uh, like Paycheck Protection Loans uh, is so important. We've all applied for the different programs and, you know, had our fingers crossed that we would be one of the lucky ones uh, to get our loans through quickly. And uh, it's just, a, it's businesses who've been around forever. This is a lifeline. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, RTV6. Well, leaders with the Indy Chamber say these loans will go fast. We'll have more information about how to apply on our website at theindychannel.com. Tonight, small business owners in Noblesville are making plans for the future. It comes after the city awarded more than 45 businesses thousands of dollars through the Small Business Resilience Grant Program. Our Nicole Griffin is following back up tonight with one of the recipients and finding out how the money is making a difference. This is where the owner of Moonshot Games is now operating his business during the pandemic. We're hustling, trying to do the best we can. We uh, launched an e-commerce store, so we're running everything out of my garage. As his store on the square in Noblesville sits empty, owner Jason Manship says they are now starting to have some success as they deliver games throughout the Noblesville area. I mean, it has just been wild. Uh, seeing all the people in Noblesville, they're excited. In order to keep up, Manship moved his store manager in his home, where he's been staying in the guest room for the last five weeks. With money from the Noblesville Small Business Resilience Grant Program, he's also been able to hire back another full-time employee and two part-time employees that are focused on delivery. We're holding part of it until we get back in the shop so we can bring more people back because we just don't know what new normal looks like on the other side of this. No idea if people are going to want to come into a game store and sit and play games. I hope, I think they will. Once Moonshot Games is able to open back up, Manship says he's already thinking ahead to safety precautions he can put in place to keep both customers and employees safe. We've been working really hard to uh, kind of game plan for that. We just bought some air purification machines. We're working on some touchless options, um, bought some stanchions today to kind of do some crowd control stuff. So we're just really thinking through all of that, but honestly, we just don't know. Manship says at a minimum, they will need to space out tables and chairs. Looking ahead, he also expects delivery to continue even after the store opens back up. Yeah, you know, we really want to cater to the folks that um, don't 
feel like leaving their house after you know the government says it's okay. Uh, but we also want to be a safe place to come if you do feel like leaving your house. He says right now they are just trying to survive and make it through the pandemic. And hopefully, with help from the grant money, they will see some business growth on the other side. Working for you in Noblesville, Nicole Griffin, RTV6. And starting today, Moonshot Games is expanding their delivery zone. They will now deliver games to Indianapolis and surrounding areas, including Carmel, Zionsville, and Fishers. And more federal aid for small business will be on the way. Today, President Trump signed the $484 billion bill that gives more help to small businesses, hospitals, and for testing. The Cornerstone $250 billion to replenish a fund to help small and medium-sized businesses with payroll, rent, and other expenses. More information from Governor Eric Holcomb today as the state takes small steps to open some things back up. Some medical procedures like routine dentist appointments can resume on Monday. The governor's latest executive order allows for elective and non-urgent medical procedures to resume as long as the facilities have enough personal protective equipment. This applies to dentists, hospitals, and veterinarians. It's unclear what the next step of reopening will be. Everyone will not go all at once if, if anyone does, and, and I suspect we will uh, begin to continue to um, open up in a very responsible, safe way to the extent that we can. And where we can't, we won't. Now to more news from the state and today's numbers on the medical front. Deaths are down, but positive cases are up when comparing day-to-day -day numbers. 34 more deaths were reported today, 10 fewer than yesterday. Statewide, the number is now at 741. 656 more Hoosiers tested positive for COVID-19, and more than 75,500 people have been tested 18% with a positive result. The state also keeps us updated about the ages of those who have died. Those ages and older account for most deaths by far at 43%. There are deaths in every age group except for birth to age 19. On the global perspective, worldwide more than 2.7 million cases and more than 195,000 deaths. Here in the United States, the deaths topped 50,000 today. More than 81,000 people have recovered. We know many of you are looking for signs of our community starting to recover from the coronavirus pandemic. An expert says Indiana may have already hit its peak when it comes to COVID-19. Caustics investigates Kara Kenny went beyond the state's numbers and talked to a health data expert who explains why he says new numbers show some positive trends. Thousands of people throughout the state of Indiana are hospitalized with COVID-19 at hospitals like Methodist in downtown Indianapolis. We talk with an expert who says hospitalizations are key, and he says the data is showing some encouraging trends. Brian Dixon is the director of public health informatics at the Regan Street Institute. He gathers data on hospitalizations to help the Indiana State Department of Health get a better picture of what's going on with COVID-19. He also created the dashboard which shows hospitalization trends. You can see the number of people hospitalized flattening out. 2,600 people were hospitalized with COVID-19 on April 23rd. The state originally said most of Indiana would peak in early May, but Dixon says new numbers show that may not be the case. I think there's some indication with the hospitalizations being flat that we may have already peaked. We, uh, that I think this is a good indication of that. Typically, you see the leading edge would be number of new deaths that are reported, right? And so some of those are actually a little bit smaller this week than they were last week. Um, hospitalizations have remained flat. Both of those together tell us that we may have already peaked. And so the, we may not reach the peak that was originally forecasted because of the policies such as uh, you know, stay at home orders and that sort of thing. And this chart shows over the past few weeks, hospitalizations in the Indianapolis area have actually dropped. Dixon says this is another encouraging sign that even though more people are being diagnosed with the disease, the number of people sick enough to go to the hospital is flattening. If you'd like to look at the latest hospitalization numbers, we've included links to the Regan Streets dashboard in this story on the RTV6 app and the IndyChannel.com. Reporting in Indianapolis, Care Kenny, RTV6. And President Trump is backtracking on comments he made yesterday about using disinfectants as an internal treatment for the coronavirus. The president suggested a combination of ultraviolet light and products like Lysol could literally zap COVID-19 out of the body. Here's what he said. 
I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that, too. Sounds interesting. We'll the right, folks who could. right. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning? Those comments raised more than a few eyebrows. In fact, the maker of Lysol responded today saying people should not, under any circumstance, use its products internally. We spoke to a local toxicology expert on why she thinks even the mere suggestion is a very bad idea. No medical science is ever going to look at drinking or injecting a disinfectant into the human body to study the effects of it on treating a virus because we already have so much data that show how very dangerous that would be. After an avalanche of criticism from medical doctors, the president today tried to clarify what he said. But I was asking a sarcastic and a very sarcastic question to the reporters in the room about disinfectant on the inside, but it does kill it and it would kill it on the hands and that would make things much better. That was done in the form of a sarcastic question to the reporters. Now this week, Trump also touted what he called emerging research on the benefits of sunlight and humidity and diminishing the virus threat. However, past studies have not shown good evidence of that. We told you how some small businesses are having trouble finding help. Coming up, how some larger companies are offering a hand up to their neighbors to help them stay in business. And if you'd like to keep moving, there's a company that could use your services. Details on dozens of available jobs. And we've had a beautiful, comfortable Friday. Hope we've been able to enjoy that. Notice our rain chances go way up tomorrow. But how long before the rain arrives? We'll have the timing coming up. Keller. Keller and Keller. Well, RTV6 is proud to be working together with the United Way of Central Indiana during this crisis. We are teaming up for the COVID-19 Community Economic Relief Fund. The initiative supports organizations that serve people and families affected by the pandemic. And you can donate too to help. Donate to the fund by texting HELP2020 to 91999. And we are seeing it over and over again during this health crisis. Communities coming together to help each other begin to rebound from the financial impact of COVID-19. Our Alyssa Donovan explains how a few local donors in one small Henry County town are working together to ensure the smaller shops can stay afloat. Small businesses are what Knightstown is made of. So when the COVID-19 closures threatened the chance for some of these shops to reopen, some larger businesses stepped in to lend a hand. I um, love to bake. That love led Lauren Owen to take ownership of Ye Old Corner Bakery, which was already well known in Knightstown. So I started here on March 1st. March 16th was when the governor uh, started the stay at home order. So it has been uh, about a month and a half of a quite a learning curve. Like most small businesses, revenue took a dive, decreasing to about a third of what's typically brought in. You know, no one steps into a business saying, maybe there's going to be a global pandemic around the corner. That never really crossed anyone's mind when, I, when this was happening. Longtime business owners aren't doing much better. Well, it's mostly got me concerned and wondering about the future. Diana Eister's shop, Timeless Furnishings, had steady business for years until this. But right now, being closed, it's, you know, I'm not making anything. While things look grim for these small business owners, their worries have recently been lifted. A few of the larger businesses in town that were willing to uh, provide seed funding for the program and our COVID-19, we call it our business survival plan. Small businesses in Knightstown can apply for a loan through the business survival plan. It can be used to help with rent, utilities, or other payments. To just meet the basic needs and get them through the next few months. The safety net one Knightstown business owners are grateful for. However, they're not shocked it was offered. I think it's wonderful, but I'm not a bit surprised because that's how Knightstown is. It makes sense that a town of people that are just giving and kind would make this giving and kind gesture. We'll get through this together. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. 
The funds were provided by the owners of CFH Enterprises, a developer in the area, as well as the owners of Hoosier Feeder and Citizen State Bank. That seed money has grown to just over $15,000 to help support the businesses in Knightstown. I'm Melissa Donovan, RTV6. And RTV6 is also working hard to help Hoosiers find jobs. We've made it our mission for more than a year, and it's more important than ever right now. The moving company, Two Men in a Truck, tell us they are still serving customers and are hiring. They are looking to hire 55 movers and drivers of both their Fishers and South Indianapolis locations. You must be at least 18 and submit to a pre-employment background check and drug screen. Starting pay ranges from $13 to over $16 an hour, plus tips, benefits, and bonuses. Medical, dental, and vision and insurance are available plus PTO earned after 60 days. We have the links to where you can apply and more information at HiringHoosiers.com. And HiringHoosiers.com is also where you can connect with more companies that are looking to hire right now and there are many of them. Now to your Storm Team 6 forecast, and what a nice day to be outside and relaxing. Even a red-winged blackbird decided to take a load off and rest on the mirror of one of our photographer's cars there. <laughs> and stayed there for quite a while. I was on this shoot with the photographer. It appears this is the day to get out there before the rain returns, though, Kevin. This bird was enjoying the day. And Mark, they're singers, man. They, they'll put on quite a concert for you, and that just shows how <laughs> relaxed everyone can be when you have a little sunshine and it wasn't too windy today. Uh, you're good to mow. If you need to get some lawn work done, attack that this evening, and I think the first half of tomorrow. Those are your best hours before our rain chances really increase north and south. 66 in Peru, 71 in Bedford, 70 in Sullivan. It's been a nice day. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. Say hello to Abby. She's ready for a walk. Eileen shared the picture and you can share your pet's picture with me. It could be a horse, a cat, a dog. I'll walk anything. Kevin.Gregory at WRTV.com. Temperatures comfortable this evening. We'll see clouds increase generally as we go through the night. Ultimately tomorrow, the chance of rain will go up to 90%, but I don't think we accomplish that until late in the day into Saturday night. We'll have some time in the morning where we're dry. Sunday, the most likely time for some rain will be in the morning, then drying out through Monday, then back to some rain Tuesday and Wednesday. Model forecasts have been wildly shifting back and forth between as much as an inch of rain and then in some cases very little. This is for Indianapolis, uh, about three quarters of an inch, I think, in uh, many spots. 7 a.m. tomorrow, a few sprinkles around, but we really wait. One o'clock in the afternoon, Lafayette, Delphi, Logansport, Peru, you see the rain there. Then as we go to 4 o'clock, still most concentrated north of a Lafayette to Kokomo line, but starting to show up just south of Bedford. The low pressure area is to the south, and see that rain south and east towards Seymour, Greensburg, Richmond. The, the question is, how far west will that come? That will ultimately impact the evening hours in Indy as to how much rain we see in the metro area. During the day tomorrow, temperatures already to 63 by noon. We should top out in the mid-60s with that increasing chance for some afternoon rain. There are the high temperatures from north to south. A little cooler north. Again, you'll have the rain earlier in the day. Second half of the weekend will be the cooler half. As you watch the forecast, then another model here just kind of spins some rain in from the southeast, especially in the evening hours. And as we get into the overnight into Sunday morning, then that will pull away. Our next opportunity for widespread rainfall, that will be Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Prior to that, we'll have the second half of Sunday, all of Monday dry, and then that thunderstorm chance goes way up Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay, I'm in negotiations for a very special guest to join me for the 615 main weather. Um, my fingers are crossed that I'll have a guest, okay? I can't tell you who it is yet, but it'll all work. <laughs> Can't wait to see, Kevin. Can't wait to see who it's going to be. Hey, the NFL draft continues tonight, and the Colts have some work to do. You can watch live coverage of rounds two and three tonight, starting at 7 o'clock here on RTV6. The Colts have the second and 12th picks this evening, 34th and 44th overall. Tonight on the News at 6, our day first has a preview of the night with Colts GM Chris Ballard. The draft continues with rounds four through seven Saturday at noon on RTV6. Making life brighter through flowers. The public can't see these blooms this year, but they won't go to waste. 
Stores at Ashley Home Store. This is home. Normally this time of year, people would be strolling the grounds of Newfields in Indianapolis, enjoying the beautiful spring flowers. But this is not a normal year, and they're closed due to the virus, but the staff there is still finding a way to work together and share the colorful blooms. Earlier this week, the staff picked thousands of tulips and donated them to the Martin Luther King Community Center. The folks there are working to distribute the flowers to those on the front lines of the COVID-19 battle. What a beautiful gesture. An essential Indiana lab is developing an antibody test so you know more about your risk of getting COVID-19. Tonight at 6, we'll show you how it works and what you need to know. We'll leave you with this live, live shot from DePaul University in Greencastle.